Welcome to Building Self Beliefs Career Podcasts. The purpose of these podcasts is to give young people a true insight into all kinds of careers and professions. In the interviews, we hear about the highs and lows of working life and how people have overcome any difficulties to make the very best of every situation. Young people will also get some brilliant advice to support their future career success. Hi, Lauren. Hello. Welcome. Um, this is Lauren Brown, and you are currently working, I was going to say, as junior doctor. But, yes. Um, so you've got a various titles. So would you like to introduce yourself and tell us? Yeah. So more? I'm Lauren, and I'm a junior doctor. Um, I'm a F2 doctor, which means foundation year two. So when you start, you start as an F1 and progress to F2. Also get called SHO, which means senior house officer. But I think that's quite an old fashioned term. Um, so, so yeah. Are you working at the moment then? So I'm working at Cromlinton Hospital. Um, I've just come off a and &E and I'm working on acute medicine, which is just a standard ward at the minute. But we kind of move around every four months. So throughout your two years of foundation training, you get a, a good experience of lots of different specialties and helps you make your mind up about what you want to do. So what's been your favourite area so far? I think there's there's kind of been good aspects to all of them so A&E was really fun and you know very very interesting got to see loads of exciting things but it's a very tiring job and you can't really keep it up for very long Um, I did a job on cardiology that I thought was also really interesting and again another very tiring job and um, but then you get the other end of the spectrum where I've had I had a job on a stroke ward which was a bit less interesting I didn't really enjoy it but it was a lot nicer of a lifestyle and you got more of a, an appreciation for the social side of medicine um, so there's kind of been good aspects to all of them um, I missed out on one of my jobs because of Covid so kind of instead of rotating like we would have at four months we ended up staying on the same job for eight months but that could and not be helped. That's limited your experience then? Um, it's hard to say so I think I mean the job that I was on the stroke job for eight months so oh, okay. um, it, when, with it being such a niche area of medicine there's not much breadth for you to learn other things in that eight months so possibly um but I mean I use the time to do like work on some projects and, and start up other things so I guess it had its pros and cons and but for the people who were on A&E for eight months they probably got a bit more experience than I did for them as well but, do you think it would be more tiring I oh definitely yeah I mean I know people who were on A&E for eight months and I think it was just really hard long hours and it, it's quite a long time to do it for you can, when it's just four months you can kind of push yourself through it and you know that it's going to come to an end but but when it's any longer than that it does get a bit much so and tell us why you chose this career path then why did you why did you decide on medicine so I, I don't I mean I guess I've always wanted to do medicine from being little and I couldn't really tell you any reason why I just decided it when I was little I've always loved working with people and I've always like talking to people and wanted a job that involved that. I really enjoyed science at school. So I guess the, those two things just kind of fit together quite nicely. And I think I just kind of went for the thing that I was most able to do and push myself. And, it, you know, if why would I do something else if I could get into medicine and I enjoyed it, then why not? And what's the process? And it's quite a difficult process, isn't it? Even to just yeah. get the course. Yeah, so it's probably changed a bit now, but when I was at school, you had to do sciences and maths at A-level, and then there's another kind of um, exam that tests, I don't really know how to describe it, I don't know how, if they do it anymore, but it's all about pattern recognition, do they yeah. still do that? Yeah, yeah. Um, so you have to sit another exam before you even apply, and then it's interviews, um, obviously doing your application and CV like everyone else, personal statement like everyone else does. Um, and then it's five years at uni, which is quite a long time before you even started working and earning money. So it is quite a long process to get in. But did you do work. any voluntary work as well along the way? Yeah. So, well, when I was at school, I did a bit of voluntary work um, at St Oswald's Hospice just in the shop there. Um, I think it just shows that you committed and put in time in on weekends and unsociable hours um I did a lot of I used to do karate so I did a lot of work with them and kind of helping out teaching the classes and so again it's more experience of just working with people working with people of all age groups which is a huge part of the job um so there is a lot of extra quicker things I know I didn't do it myself but a lot of people do Duke of Edinburgh and there's you know there's all sorts of things that you can do just 
just to show that you're committed to, to something and that you, you're willing to put the time and effort in. And what, what about your degree then, the five years? Where did you go? Where did you study? So I was at Newcastle University, um, they kind of paired with Durham, but I was at Newcastle campus the whole time. Um, so for the first two years, it's very much lecture based. Um, you do get some kind of some time in the dissecting room where you learn anatomy with real life models and that kind of thing. And you learn communication skills, how to work with patients. And then they, in your third year, they start to ease you into the hospital environment and working with real patients. It becomes a lot more practical and you learn your practical skills there. So in my third year, I was at North Tyneside and Wandsbeck Hospitals and Cromlinton Hospital. Um, and then it changes again in your fourth year. So you you'd get to choose some time as to on the placements in a topic that you enjoy. So I did a couple of mine in psychiatry and I did a placement at a GP practice all across the Northeast. And then um, you get to do an elective, which is the best bit of the course by far, where you can, uh, well, you can stay in this country if you want, but a lot of people go far and wide to a country that you want to. And where did you go? So I went to Sri Lanka for mine. Um, so you get a very, very different aspect of what medicine's like there. It's nice to do a bit of traveling and, and take a bit of a break away from the lecture theater. What did you do in Sri Lanka? Were you in the actual hospitals? Yeah, so you, we spent a lot of time in the hospitals. Um, I spent some time on a psychiatry ward, which was very, very different to what it's like over here. Um, and some time on the children's ward as well. But I mean, the hospitals, it makes you realize how lucky we are over here. Just the, the sorry state that some of the hospitals were in, it was, um, it's quite emotional at first when you see it and, and you think how lucky we are. Um, I remember um, we were there in 1999 in Sri Lanka yeah. and I was a little bit unwell. I wasn't that bad, but our children uh -huh. insisted that I went to the hospital. Yeah. And they insisted I went to the front and I was like, no, no, I don't mind waiting. I'm like, yeah. no, 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 you've got, and I was like, look, I really, I'm not that ill. Uh -huh. I'm really sick people just sit on the doors and uh, on the um, corridors. Uh, they yeah. do have, I'm sure in my memory, they have, they do have a kind of NHS system, don't they? Yeah. So it's not as bad as. Uh -huh. that, I think, so they have a lot of price so the more kind of wealthy people have they go to private hospitals and I think that's probably a bit more like what we have in terms of like cleanliness and um but but the ones we went to I, I think it's similar to an NHS system but like you yeah, said the corridors yeah corridors are just full of people weird, do they? The will no, out, no. Like, whereas um you know, in some places yeah so it's nice to get an idea of, of how medicine works in other countries do you think uh, it helps you adapt your practice? Yeah, definitely. And I think kind of seeing how other people practice makes you realise why we do things the way we do, because it works. But also you can get, I mean, you, you can get some other ideas from other places and think, oh, that's a really good way of doing things. Why don't we do that in the UK? One thing that stands out that you learned that you thought I could actually... Um, I think it was like just the, the communication skills that they have over there with patients and with students so it was a lot more old-fashioned I couldn't say that I particularly got taught very well compared to what I get taught over here um, and the war rounds was all about having one consultant with a group of 20 medical students following him around and if you stood at the back you can't hear a word and I think that that kind of really implemented how important the way we teach in our medical schools and in the hospitals here and how it reassures the patients a lot more. It was it was a lot more old fashioned over there. And I think that that's something that I took away that that's not the way to do it. Yeah, well, in, well that's as interesting as anything, isn't it? You yeah. Get context a little bit more. Yeah. And what did you do after you qualified then? Where did you go? So, um, so after I finished my five years, um, you then kind of apply for jobs all over the country um, and you basically have to rank all of the jobs throughout the UK from top to bottom, which is very, quite overwhelming. So I put the northeast down because I wanted to stay here um, and then you rank the jobs again within the northeast. Um, so at the minute I'm working within the Northumbria Trust. So that kind of is Cramlinton Hospital, Wandsbeck, North Tyneside, and then all the local GPs and clinics in the area. So we will rotate between all the three hospitals. So you get quite a good experience of all of them. And what's your next stage then? What do you think you're going to do next? Do you have to make some kind of decision about specialising? 
So usually kind of after the foundation years one and two, you then go into core training. So whether that's core medical, core surgical or psychiatry or GP training, you usually apply for that and then go on and progress throughout that specialty. Um, I think nowadays a lot more people are after your foundation year two taking a year out. A lot of people kind of go to Australia, go traveling for a year. Um, something that I'm quite interested in doing is doing a teaching year where you still work clinical as a doctor, but spend a lot of time teaching the medical students and passing on skills to them. Um, just to take a bit of time out before you commit to the specialty training and, and to make sure that it's you know what you want to do and get a bit more experience under your belt as well for the application if you did the training for the year could you kind of if you thought actually it's not really what the way I want to go could you then change direction yeah I, th I think you probably could so I mean I want to do some teaching in psychiatry and I guess that if I if I did it and realized that it wasn't for me you can kind of chop and change you could you could move across to medicine it gives you more of an idea as to which line you want to go down especially even if you start your training there's a lot of people that I've spoke to who think that they want to do a and &E, for example and then go into it and say oh this isn't for me pull out and go into GP training and so a lot, a lot of people do do change their minds even throughout their specialty training and I think that it's a good thing that we're allowed to do that I think because, I think you totally correct in that sense I think it's reassuring actually yeah. because it's such a big commitment I mean compared to other degrees if you're spending five years investing so much time and money really into it isn't it and then yeah you don't want to get to the end of that and think oh actually this isn't what I want to be doing yeah <laughs> so I think it's I think it's good it's good that we get so much experience in lots of different things and that you can chop and change your mind as much as much as you want really um because it is a big commitment to say this is what I want to do for the rest of my life which is really when you commit into medicine, you say in that from being, you know, 16 years old at school, I decided to write, this is what I'm going to spend the rest of my life doing. It's a very big commitment. So it's nice that there's so much choice. And at 16, do you think you would have gone into psychiatry? I don't know, to be honest. I think at that stage, you don't really have enough actual experience to know. And, and because there's so many areas of medicine that you could go into, it would be impossible for you. I mean, some people do, some people know from day one that they want to be a surgeon. But for me, I think that there's a lot of, you know, there's so many areas you want to get a bit of experience in each. And that, for me, especially, there's been some times where I've been really surprised. For example, I, when I got my A&E job, I thought I'm going to absolutely hate this. It's not my cup of tea at all, but then I loved it. So uh -huh. I guess there's probably a lot of people that will find their career you know come across it in a you, you didn't want to do the surgery side the surgeon side um I don't I'm not a very practical person I don't really like hands-on things <laughs> um I, I don't know I just I, I think it's more interesting to talk to patients and I would enjoy sitting for hours and finding everything about someone's life rather than just kind of fixing the problem there and then and um, what about writing reports as well so you think that that idea of that Kind of having that conversation and then being able to research it almost isn't it and yeah. investigate it further yeah exactly and you, you can just kind of go back and and think a lot about what they've said and then spend a long time writing it up and i really enjoy writing as well so that's quite a nice aspect of it um i guess i'm probably just a bit nosy and i like to know everything about someone rather than just the one specific problem that they've come in with so i think it, it's uh I think it's it. Well, I, I'll confess here, Lauren, I did teach you English as well. So I'm really yeah. glad that did that because you were brilliant at English as well. Like, I know you said you. <laughs> you were brilliant at English as well. So I think it's really interesting that, like, over time, that's what you've evolved, you, you know, your thought process and what you thought yeah. you was kind of evolved into mm -hmm. taking advantage of your other strengths, really. Yeah, exactly. Because, you know, if I'm going to be doing it forever, I need to be good at it but also enjoy it and find it interesting and yes I really really loved English at school but would I have done it as a degree I don't know so I think it's I think it, this is a good way to bring how much I liked English into a medical job which I didn't I think, think I would be able well, to do. The, I think we, I was talking about this to someone else about how if you're naturally good at sciences which you were hmm. I, I do think it's like the, a good route to kind yeah. of just pick just select uh -huh. and do what you're good at. Yeah. It's like straightforward. It's yeah, yeah, exactly. And then 
you know, you can branch out later or you might find you're better at other things later on. Yeah. But when you're younger, it's just so much easier to just mm-hmm. go with what you're good or at. Or with your strength, yeah. Uh-huh, exactly. Um, then kind of try and work out, you know, or try mm-hmm. and work on the things that you're not so good at at that age yeah. mm-hmm. is how I see it as well. Yeah. And I think when you're younger as well, if, if I set my heart, say when I was younger, if I said, oh, I really want to be a surgeon and then it comes to it years down the line and you realise it's not for you, you could probably be quite disappointed and think, oh, well, this is what I've always wanted to do, but I actually hate it. So I think it's really good to have an open mind. Well, I think with me, I mean, I did the English degree and then I was like, oh, I'm not going to be an English teacher. And then everyone's like, well, you wasted, you should be an English teacher. So then I was an English teacher. Uh-huh. And yeah. then I, the, one of the reasons for me doing English teaching was so I didn't have to move south because at the time... Mm-hmm. If you, you, it was a massive brain drain from the north. And it was like, everyone, yeah. if you've got to be successful, you know, and I was like, no, no, why should I move south? Yeah. And stay north. And then I went to London anyway. Yeah. <laughs> but then you're back north. In London. So all the way along, I, there was always things I said, oh, no, I'm not doing that. And then I thought, oh, actually. And you change mind. Yeah. yeah. So I think it is important to change your mind as well. And mm-hmm. not, you know, you don't have to have your heart set on things. Or if you, if it doesn't work out, make a change. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Exactly. So what advice have you got for young people considering medicine or considering the sciences, I suppose? Um, I would say, like, like we've said, you've definitely got to enjoy it. I think, you know, yes, if you being good at it's one thing, but you've got to enjoy it and be passionate about it. Um, I would say always keep an open mind as well. Um, and, you know, just because it's the sciences, it doesn't mean that there's not other aspects to it, like what I want to go into. And there's loads of social sides to medicine and, and there's so much of a bigger picture than it's sold to you at school. Um, and you've yeah. The social side a couple of times. So what you've said about Sri Lanka, do you think, is there a, like a camaraderie then in medicine that you know, yeah. where you develop a, a much stronger social, especially if you, I suppose if you're together for five years. Well, exactly. Yeah. So you get to know everyone very well. It's a long time that you that you're with everybody um, and, and kind of your lecturers and the people who teach you. And obviously the consultants and all the doctors who work in the hospital, some of them who taught me when I was a third year medical student are now the consultant on my ward who I work with every single day. So you do kind of get into a big group spirit you you have to you have to love working with people it's not really a job if you if you just want to sit in a, in an office all day on your own it's not that it's a very very sociable job in more ways you've than one you've got to be good at both haven't you you've got to mm-hmm. have that academic ability to study and learn yeah and kind of and then apply it I suppose what you were saying as well isn't it yeah in that kind of medicine format you you know you've got it's the application of it that's really important not just because mm-hmm. some people are brilliant at learning ideas and learning yeah but actually mm-hmm. putting it into practice is a totally different thing. Yeah. And I would say as well to make sure that it's what you want to do. And like, this is something that I've always wanted to do and nobody ever pushed me into it. Um, but you do meet a handful of people who maybe it wasn't what they wanted to do, but because they were clever at school, they thought, oh, I should do it because my mum's told me to. I was correct, um, pressure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then, it, you know, it comes to it now and they don't want to be a doctor anymore because... It's not what they wanted to do in the first place. So you you have to want to do it yourself and and have that motivation yourself. Oh, that's really good advice. Well, thank you very much for coming along today, Laura. That's fine. See you. And I'm so pleased that you're using your English skills. <laughs> thank you for joining us today. If you're interested in learning more about other careers, please go to our website at buildingselfbelief.org where you can find many more examples of great career paths to potentially take. If you need any advice about anything we've discussed in the podcast, please get in touch. Our purpose is to support young people whenever we can.